All right, let's get into the pathology. First off, pericardial effusion. Remember, after heart beating, that's our next question. So pericardial effusions usually, uh, especially in more acute settings, are going to look black. Remember, on ultrasound, fluid is typically black. And pericardial effusions usually are made up of fluid. So you can see this black stuff surrounding the heart. Here it's circumferential. That's pericardial effusion. Here we see another example of black fluid surrounding the heart, pericardial effusion. And that's pretty much it in this view. One thing we will note, we don't see it great here, but right here is the descending aorta. Pericardial effusions should come up and go towards the front of the descending aorta. Sometimes pleural effusions will look similar, but as you look at the descending aorta, they will go down behind. So that can help you differentiate the two sometimes, and sometimes you'll see both. Uh, a couple more views. I love the peristernal short axis view for seeing pericardial effusions. Sometimes it's easier to see in this view, so here it is in this dependent area or behind the left ventricle. And here we see in this possibly a subcostal subxiphoid view, we see black fluid circumferentially surrounding the heart. Pericardial effusions. Hopefully relatively easy to recognize. Now, the most important reason to recognize a pericardial effusion is uh, to recognize a patient who's in cardiac tamponade. And it's important to recognize that a patient who's got an asymptomatic effusion is on one end of the spectrum, and the patient who is hypotensive, tachycardic, or possibly even in cardiac arrest is on the far other end of the spectrum where they've got clinical evidence of cardiac tamponade. And there's a lot of gradations of this that are somewhere in the middle. And that's where you're going to see some changes on echocardiogram, and you're going to have to correlate that with your whole clinical picture. So you might see some early tamponade changes without a lot of clinical changes. That all depends on how fast it accumulated and how big it is, uh, what their intravascular volume status is. So there's a lot of factors that play into how symptomatic they are and how sick they're going to be. So if you remember anything about differentiating just a simple pericardial effusion from tamponade, uh, one of the big things, one of the biggest things you can remember is just collapse of the right side of the heart. And usually the easiest to recognize is right ventricular collapse. Uh, there is systolic right atrial collapse, but sometimes that's more difficult to recognize. Now that's the biggest thing, right heart collapse uh, in the patient who has a pericardial effusion. Kind of hard to have tamponade without an effusion. And then we'll also talk about uh, losing the phasicity of the inferior vena cava, uh, another secondary finding you can look for. So here we go. Here are some examples. So here we have a heart. We've got black fluid all the way around it. And you can see here that we get collapse, so that right ventricle kind of makes a sine wave, or sometimes people will describe it as someone jumping on it during diastole. You see it dent. And here we've got an apical four-chamber view. We've got a pretty good-sized pericardial effusion all the way around. And we can see this right ventricle has a hard time filling and just dents in. It certainly doesn't move the way that it normally moved in some of your other views. So this is uh, echocardiographic evidence of tamper. I will also point out in this view over here, we've got a big pleural effusion. See this fluid all goes down kind of behind the descending aorta, which is right here. And our pericardial fluid wraps around and comes up in front of that descending aorta. So that's why that's such an important landmark. A couple more examples. Here we've got a pretty significant pericardial effusion and a right ventricle that's denting in and not really filling at all, especially down towards the apex. Pericardial effusion wraps around here. We've also got pleural effusion down behind. Here we've got a subcostal view of a pretty significant um, pericardial effusion and a denting right ventricle. And just in case you didn't see it all, another example. Large amount of fluid around this heart. And what we see here, this is right atrium here. This right ventricle can't even fill. There's so much pressure on it. Uh, you can barely see it filling at all. So it doesn't really dent because it doesn't ever really fill much at all. So this is echocardiographic evidence of tamponade. And here we see very nicely this denting of the right ventricle here in this peristernal long axis view with this moderate to large pericardial effusion. So echocardiographic evidence of tamponade. Now you still have to correlate the rest of your clinical picture to make, and make decisions. Something to be careful about, one of the pitfalls, and we got a couple of these we'll talk about, is the fat pad. Uh, it's very common to see a cardio fat pad around the heart, and sometimes that's confused for an effusion. You see it here. Some clues are that it's usually more echogenic, so it's more gray. You see how 
you look to those other examples, the pericardial fusions were pretty much jet black. They were at least the same darkness as the fluid inside the heart. You see this fat pad, it's got it's more grayness to it. There's gray, gray flecks in there. And you'll notice as it moves, it kind of moves with the heart. It has a more constant shape. It gets a little bit thicker um, and thinner, but it stays about the same distance from the heart the whole time. And certainly there's, there are no tamponade findings, so this right ventricle doesn't collapse at all. And you never see changes in the angles. This thing stays a nice uh, 90 degree angle from the rest of the heart most of the time, whereas with pericardial fusions, there's a little bit of movement. You'll get changes in angles and changes in shape that you'll notice with a little bit more practice that'll help you differentiate fat pads from pericardial fusions. And sometimes if it's small and not causing any tamponade findings, it may not matter that much. Trivial or trace pericardial fusions really aren't that much clinically significant anyway. All right, so once again, put them side by side. We see this fat pad here. It's more echogenic. It's got a more constant shape, stays a more constant distance from the heart. Over here we see this more black pericardial fusion. And you see how these angles change as the heart beats within this effusion? This is not an example that has tamponade, but you can see these changes. Like here it loses distance and gets bigger here. These more sharp angles. That gives you more of that sense of a heart beating inside fluid, whereas this is a heart beating with a little bit of fat wrapped around it, staying a more constant shape. Hopefully that will help you differentiate these two. All right, enough of pericardial fusions and tamponade. Let's go on to some signs of left ventricular failure. This might be the patient who's got a history of COPD, and maybe they've got CHF as well, and they're short of breath, and looking at their heart might help you. Or maybe they're in shock, and you're trying to differentiate cardiogenic shock from other types of shock, and that's what uh, left ventricular failure may help you with. So before we get into left ventricular failure, let's just do a little reminder, some normal cardiac function, what it looks like. So pay attention to this left ventricle, parasternal long axis view, look at that volume change, look at that mitral valve, that anterior leaflet comes up and hits the septum during the early filling phase of diastole. It's got a nice shape, it's got pretty uniform thickening across all the ventricular walls. The mitral valve opens nice and wide during the early portions of diastole and the endocardium comes together and our volume changes at least 50%, it's probably more like 60-65% in this example here. Now here are some signs of failure. Look at these ventricles. Not much volume change going on here. Our mitral valve doesn't open much, that's because there's not enough fluid transfer to push that valve open. And same thing here, our volume doesn't change a whole lot and that mitral valve barely, barely squeaks open at all. And we even see that our walls don't really thicken as much here in this example as we saw in our more normal example earlier. Now you should always look at multiple views. And so in these views we can see short axis views. Here's our left ventricle. We see walls not thickening very much. We see volume not changing very much. And same thing here. We see some good thickening here in this uh, mid septum. But this rest of this heart this left ventricle not thickening a whole lot, the volume not changing a whole lot. Now, pitfall. As with all of ultrasound, all of medicine, you have to take the whole picture into account. So just because you see left ventricular dysfunction or failure, you have to ask yourself, does that fit? Maybe they have chronic CHF, and now they're having a COPD exacerbation, and that's why they're short of breath. Um, there are history and physical exam findings to help you with that. There are also some ultrasound findings of the lungs that we can talk about later on, not today, that will help you with that as well. And patients who are in shock, they may have a history of chronic CHF, they have, may have a chronically poor ejection fraction, and they're also in septic shock. So that's it's important, again, correlate the whole clinical picture to help you figure out what's going on. That's a pretty good advice right there. All right, a couple other things that you might uh, see or pick up, and I want you to recognize some cardiomyopathies, some of the more obvious ones that you hopefully can recognize without a lot of specific detailed measurements, or at least have clues to and um, clues for when someone needs referral. So the first one is dilated cardiomyopathy, and again, I'm not a fan at this level of taking a ton of measurements. I'm interested in you recognizing things that are relatively obvious just by the eyeball. So here we see left ventricles that are way too big, not functioning incredibly well, and uh, they're just really dilated. This is, these are examples of dilated cardiomyopathies. 
there are lots of different reasons you might get a dilated cardiomyopathy. We're not going to go much into that, but seeing it and recognizing it is important because these are patients who typically are going to have a higher risk of sudden death. Uh, they're probably going to have symptoms, and you might want to know about that. But again, we see dilated chambers, pretty obvious, hopefully without measurements. We see poor function, not a lot of volume change, poor opening of the mitral valve. These are dilated cardiomyopathies. And here are some hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. Again, long list of different etiologies, but hopefully, again, you can recognize these walls are just massively thick. And if you, again, the more normals you see, the more this stands out. Massively thick here, even septum more so than the free wall, although both walls are hypertrophic. Here we've got a pretty symmetric looking uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hopefully, you can recognize this and then decide. How does this fit into the rest of my clinical picture? Is this someone that needs uh, referral for a more comprehensive echocardiogram? And I'll just point out here, just for other education, here's our descending aorta. See this fluid? Quiz, plural or pericardial? All right, this is plural fluid. See it goes down behind the descending aorta. So it's not pericardial effusion, it is pleural effusion. All right, so another pitfall. Remember, you may have a patient with syncope or shortness of breath or whatever symptoms. Even if they have a normal bedside limited echocardiogram, they still could have a lot of other stuff going on. They can still have other heart pathology that you may not uh, be able to see or recognize. Coronary artery disease is not easily diagnosed by bedside echocardiogram. So just remember, a normal bedside echocardiogram doesn't rule out everything else on your differential. All right, acute right ventricular strain, which really we're talking about right ventricular dilation that may be acute. And usually if we're worried about this, we're talking about someone with an acute massive or submassive pulmonary embolism. So what you'll, you may see is a dilated right ventricle that's usually going to be hypokinetic. And if you remember before, we talked about right ventricle, aortic root, left atrium being about equal in size. Uh, but not so in this example, right? Right ventricle is too big and it's pretty hypokinetic. And you'll often also see the septum pushing in towards the left because of the high pressures in the right side of the heart. Here we see left heart, remember, is over here on this side. This view is taken properly. Small left ventricle, massive, gigantic right ventricle, and even septum pushing in towards the left or paradoxical septal motion. And there's also, you, can, you may hear something called the McConnell sign or the apical wink, where you have a mostly hypokinetic dilated right ventricle, but then a hyperkinetic, over time, hard working right ventricular apex. And that's something that might be seen in acute right ventricular strain in someone with a massive PE. Just a few more examples. Again, small left ventricle here, massively dilated right ventricle. Remember, the right ventricle should always be smaller than the left ventricle. So if it's bigger than the left ventricle, then there's probably a big problem. And again, we see here left ventricle small compared to the right. Uh, this is the moderator band here. We see some paradoxical septal motion, a uh, big right atrium as well. In your parasternal short axis views, you may see something that's called the D sign. Now, you'll often hear me harp on people to get good views and make the left ventricle look like a donut and make it as round as possible so you don't artificially create this sign. But you see here you've got a giant right ventricle causing high pressure, flattening out the septum and making it go from an O to a D. Hope you guys recognize that. So that's the D sign in the peristomal short axis view, a sign of right ventricular pressure volume overload. You can even see this on CT scan sometimes. This is a patient with bilateral significant PEs. You see the D sign, their left ventricle here. Big right ventricle, small left, flattened septum. All right, I've always got things to warn you about, right? So there are lots of chronic causes of right ventricular strain or right ventricular dilation. So again, just because you see it may not necessarily be acute. You have to correlate the whole clinical picture. Maybe they have a history of chronic pulmonary hypertension, uh, which some can frequently go along with uh, chronic COPD, something we never see around here, right? So if you think this is due to a massive PE, 
then you can also go you've got an ultrasound right there right so look for a clot in their legs if you see a clot in their legs the whole history fits and you see dilated right heart you think it's acute and that makes your case for an acute PE a little bit stronger especially if the patient's too sick to go for a CAT scan and you need to maybe push thrombolytics all right enough about right heart strain we're going to talk about obvious aortic root pathology and the most important reason to look at this is someone with aortic dissection so remember we talked about right ventricle aortic root left atrium they should be about equal in size which one's too big in this picture you got it it's the aortic root you've got a dilated aortic root and if you went and took some other views of their aorta maybe you would see this flap so this is a patient with acute aortic dissection knowing this quickly at the bedside when the patient first presents may be life-saving and so I think it's worth looking at not going to pick this up that often but when you do it's a game changer now notice even though in this case you see a flap in the abdominal aorta which you don't reliably see you don't see it up here it's probably there and we just don't get a good view of it but the abnormality of the aortic root is the key to helping you make this diagnosis and here we measure uh, we got a frozen frame we measure almost five centimeters here for an adult should be no larger than four centimeters all right caution pitfall important thing Transthoracic echo may help you suspect or almost rule in the diagnosis of aortic dissection, but it is not good enough to exclude it. You may not see the root that well. It may not be that dilated immediately. The flaps are not seen a lot of the time. So if you highly suspect this diagnosis, transthoracic echo is probably not enough to rule it out. It's more important to help you pick it up quickly at the bedside before the patient runs off to other imaging. Got that? Don't exclude dissection with transthoracic echo or any bedside ultrasound. All right, just really gross, obvious valvular pathology that you might see, maybe important to recognize, and sometimes for referral, and in some very select uh, acute scenarios. Um, something you're going to see very commonly is um, calcified aortic valve. So here's our aortic valve right here, and you'll see this much more bright white than it should be. Usually. The leaflets of the aortic valve are not that easy to see on a bedside echocardiogram because they're nice and thin. If they're easy to see and bright white like this, then you've got to suspect that they're calcified. Now this is almost never an emergency, but certainly probably warrants further investigation, especially in patients who are having symptoms, um, because it may be an indicator of aortic stenosis. To really make that diagnosis, especially to quantify it, you need the echo lab. Something else that's very common that you're going to see uh, is annular calcification of the mitral valve so here we see a little bit of calcification around this mitral valve this is very common and almost never clinically significant uh, but you'll see it and it's important to recognize it and and know that eh, it's probably okay uh, on the other hand what you might also see is rheumatic mitral stenosis where you'll get doming of especially the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve we've also got some doming here in this aortic valve and this may be clinically significant causing uh, important mitral stenosis and commonly mitral regurgitation as well. You see this, important to recognize, and uh, if it's never been seen before, probably needs referral uh, to the echo lab for further quantification and uh, clarification, especially if your patients are symptomatic. Something else that you might see, mitral regurgitation. So remember the jobs of the valves, they have two jobs. They open and they close. So stenosis, we saw here a minute ago, is when they don't open well. And regurgitation is when they don't close well. So here if we apply color, color Doppler, across this mitral valve, we'll notice during systole, remember during systole, the blood should be going out the aorta, uh, should not be going back in to the left atrium. But we're seeing a pretty significant jet of blood flow going back into the left atrium so this is a pretty significant mitral regurgitation here we see it as well we see a jet of mitral regurgitation in most scenarios this is more of a chronic disease process uh, however it may be a complication of an acute myocardial infarction and in that case usually patients are looking pretty sick presenting in cardiogenic shock so if you've got cardiogenic shock or you've got a patient in shock and it looks cardiogenic put some color across their mitral and aortic valves to look for acute regurgitation because it may clue you into some of those other complications. I'm not going to go into too much detail about those at the moment.
Okay, but remember, quantifying valve pathology, getting specific information about how severe it is and is this person a surgical candidate or not, that's all stuff that is best done in the echo lab. Uh, you don't necessarily have the time and maybe don't have the interest to spend uh, 45 minutes quantifying that pathology at the bedside and the equipment probably isn't adequate especially if you're using the handhelds anyway so don't try to quantify that just say yeah yes or no maybe I see regurgitation or not maybe I see calcification on the valves or not don't quantify mild moderate severe that's not not your job at the bedside alright so decision making we talked a lot about normal we talked about pathology how do you use this stuff how does it useful? Does it really matter? Is it really going to make a difference? I think it makes a huge difference. More information, better information, better decisions, better patient care, life-saving at times. Okay, so you've got the patient in cardiac arrest. You're going to ask, is their heart beating? Yes or no? Uh, that's important because sometimes you're recognizing the pulse is not as reliable as we think it is. I actually don't necessarily care about pulses in cardiac arrest. I let somebody that's checking it check it, but when it's time for a pulse check, I'm looking at the heart. That's going to tell me if their heart's beating or not, and if it's beating effectively or not. Next, if they're in cardiac arrest, is tamponade the cause? If tamponade is the cause, then there's an important and very specific fix for that. So that's important to know. And the most reliable way to make that diagnosis, bedside echocardiogram. Uh, next up, left ventricular failure. Now, if it's early in your cardiac arrest and it's left ventricular failure, then that's going to help you and you may be able to augment that and help that. Uh, if it's a cardiac arrest that's been going on for quite a while and the heart has been deprived of oxygen for a while, they may have left ventricular failure because of the hypoxia and it will be hard to know if that's really a primary or a secondary thing. Next up, do they have a giant dilated right ventricle and does the history fit a massive PE? Maybe, and that might help you direct your therapy. Uh, that's a controversial area so that's all I'm going to say about it at the moment, but uh, for further discussion. Uh, do they have a dilated aortic root? And to make you think, do they have aortic dissection? If they're in cardiac arrest with a dilated aortic root and acute aortic dissection, their prognosis is probably going to be pretty bad, but may give you some information to help you decide how to further care for this patient. So those are some of the ways that bedside echo can help you in cardiac arrest. Look for things that are reversible and look for things that you can target specific therapy for. All right, how about the person who's in shock, who's hypotensive? It turns out by bedside clinical information, we're not as good as we think we are at figuring out the etiology of shock. And uh, the biggest money thing you can do with an ultrasound machine of someone who's in shock is look at their heart. Because you will either diagnose or exclude some things on your differential very quickly and your differential diagnosis will be much more accurate, shorter, and uh, you'll be much more confident in the decisions you make. So do they have signs of obstructive shock? Like, do they have cardiac tamponade? If so, again, there are specific therapies for that. Fluids, maybe you need to drain that effusion. Do they have signs of right ventricular strain, dilation of the right ventricle? Could this be a massive PE? may not be diagnostic, but it might take you down the right road much more quickly at the bedside. They're in shock and they have left ventricular failure and the rest of the clinical picture fits, then maybe it's cardiogenic shock and you can, again, direct your therapies, uh, get the patient uh, the right treatment more quickly because of the information you got at the bedside. Do they have a dilated aortic root that's going to make you think that they're, they have a dissection? Now, a good portion of patients with dissection don't present with cardiogenic shock or present with shock, but if they do and you can quickly clue yourself into this diagnosis, you save time, maybe you save a life. All right, so those are the most important ones, the patients who are in cardiac arrest, patients who are in shock. But frequently, we also see patients with symptoms, right? They've got chest pain, they've got shortness of breath, they've passed out, they've got palpitations. So taking some views, some high-quality views, and recognizing the anatomy and knowing the abnormalities can help you make decisions and risk stratify some of these patients a little bit. Do they have a pericardial fusion or tamponade? Some of the most frequent cases that are missed uh, in our department, luckily not as much anymore because we all use ultrasound, but our young patients who are short of breath and takes our, their third visit before we recognize that they've got pericardial fusion or maybe even signs of tamponade. There are specific treatments for that and uh, seeing a patient who's short of breath and seeing this drastically changes what your plan is going to be.
Uh, do they have obvious left ventricular dysfunction? Remember, these sometimes young patients present with shortness of breath, and maybe they've got an undiagnosed cardiac myopathy. Or if they've got syncope, and they've got a large left ventricle, their risk of sudden cardiac death suddenly goes up. And maybe that's a patient you th should think about admitting, uh, versus if it's someone with a nice functioning left ventricle. Again, depending on their whole clinical scenario, maybe they're okay to go home. Echo is not the sole decision maker. Uh, do they have a dilated right heart? Anecdotally, some patients with even massive PEs might not look that sick. Their vitals might not be that bad because they're compensating. Maybe they're young and otherwise pretty healthy. Uh, you see a dilated right ventricle, suddenly you've got a new thing on your, your differential diagnosis and you're going to head down a different pathway. Or do they have obvious valve or aortic root pathology? Again, depending on their symptoms, these findings may clue you into something that's going on a little bit more quickly at the bedside and get you down the right path instead of getting you down the wrong path. So, summary points. Uh, bedside echocardiogram can add very useful information to your very well done history and your very thorough and appropriate physical exam. It does require practice. That's why we're putting this into your clerkships. We want you to do this now and learn this so that when you're taking care of patients on your own, you can be pretty good at it. It takes practice acquiring images, recognizing normal anatomy, and then reviewing cases and reviewing abnormals so that when you see those, you can recognize them. A bedside echocardiogram does not replace uh, the information that's obtained in the echo lab. We talked about essentially four views. In most echo studies that are done in the lab, there are at least 90 views and it takes you know, 45 minutes sometimes to get this whole thing done. So you're not going to do that at the bedside. You don't have time for that. So lastly, I want to close in conclusion with the five questions that I want you to ask every time you look at a patient's heart. Is it beating? Is there a pericardial effusion? Is there obvious left ventricular dysfunction? Is there right ventricular dilation, which might make you think of acute strain in PE? Is there obvious valvular or aortic root pathology that might clue you in to a diagnosis that maybe wasn't that high on your differential to begin with. I think that's everything. I hope it was useful for you. I want you to get on that cardiology rotation. I want you to use those handhelds. I want you to practice doing echoes. Save lives. Thanks a lot.